Hey everyone, welcome to Horse Talk. Our topic tonight is colic in horses. This is one of my passionate uh, topics I love to talk about because so many people are a little bit afraid of colic and they don't understand it yet. It's a very simple concept and simple idea. So the webinar is really structured and it's basically going to be an overview and then talk about the horse advocate and why worldwide webcast and of course why um, why colic is a topic. All right, <clears throat> so the overcast, <laughs> overcast, listen to me, <laughs> the overview, it's a beautiful day today, it's just been gorgeous all day. Anyway, um, there's going to be recording this webinar for those of you who are members who can take a look at this, red or blue members of the Horses Advocate, um, but it'll be free for a little bit, probably about 7 or 10 or 14 days, somewhere in there. You can stop by the horsesadvocate.com and take a look at it under the menu heading called Horse Talk, and you'll be able to see these. All right, so we're going to talk about the basics of colic, some of the types of colic, medical versus surgical. Now, that's a really important one. When we go over that, just pay attention because that's really the essence of what I want to talk about. Then talk about some of the medical and, and surgical treatments and the, and the points that I want to go over and how to prevent this and some of the take-home points. So anyway, the Horse Advocate is a part of the equine practice. You can go to thehorsesadvocate.com and get all the information there. I'll have a little bit toward the end of this, especially um, to let you know that there's a special membership price that we've got going here uh, that make it easy for you to access all the material that's on the website. It covers 350 different topics, mostly husbandry, but as, as well as surgery, dentistry, medicine, disease. It's pretty comprehensive, especially if you want to learn how to build a barn. But the Horse Advocate is here to teach horse owners to become advocates for the horse living in a human world. And I want to simplify the fundamentals because once you simplify it and you can understand it, then you're going to be knowledgeable about raising a horse. And they're fun to watch. And we can get a deeper discussion of the subject, especially if you guys write down some questions, shoot them off to me, and uh, I'll try to answer them either throughout the webinar or toward the end. Okay, why colic? Well, colic is one of those things that affects every horse around the world. doesn't matter what sport you're in, how long you've been with horses. At some point, you're going to have a colic case, and I want to help you go through that process. All right, here's a bunch of words here I'm just going to read and you can read with me. As a veterinarian, I find that colic is a highly emotional time for the owner. Usually the owner is scared and thinks the worst. Veterinarians use logic and rule in or out things based on their exam. From that, they are able to advise the owner. However, because the owner is under stress, they often don't hear or understand what is being said. An educated owner will be able to make the right decisions and become the horse's advocate. Colic is also an economic event that can be catastrophic to the horse and to the bank account. Those without insurance are facing a minimum of a $500 vet bill, and with surgery and aftercare, this can escalate to 20 times or more. Many horse owners hesitate to call the vet, afraid of the bill they will have. This is very unwise and may lead either to a higher bill or the death of your horse or both. Prevention will save you money, and I mean lots of money. All right, so as we just sit around waiting for a couple more people to roll in, I just want to talk just briefly about who I am. That's me with a horse of mine that's retired now. He's not of mine. He's a client's horse, a high-end dressage horse. And he and I got along just famously. Anyway, I was, I've was i been a horseman since 1973. I've been a veterinarian since 1984 when I graduated from Cornell Veterinary School in Ithaca, New York. I've owned many, many, many horses and witnessed many, many, many colics. And I also am a storyteller and a photo photographer. So all these photographs here, other than the ones of me, are by me. And also, I like to throw in a couple of stories in here because stories always help learn. Um, and I've got some really cool stories to talk about. So stay tuned for that. We'll make sure that things uh, stay pretty happy and easy going. So let's talk about what is colic. 
Well, it's pain coming from the abdomen. Uh, usually it's from the GI tract. GI stands for gastrointestinal, which basically means anything from the mouth down the tube uh, through the intestines and out the anus. But it can come from other areas, which we're going to discuss a little bit later. But the basics of the GI tract are you have the mouth, you have the esophagus or the food pipe that goes into the stomach. From there you go into the small intestine and then from there it goes into the cecum. And the cecum is really cool because it's what I call a sock. It's a blind sack. The food comes in from the top of the sock, goes all the way down on the toe, and comes all the way back out where it entered. And it's just an interesting um, added feature to the horse that to me doesn't make sense but it's there for a reason and they can't live without it. And then it goes on to the large bowel, which makes a huge circle. It goes from basically where the hips are all the way forward down to where the girth comes, makes a 180 degree turn and comes all the way to the back. And then it rises up and does another 180 degree turn, heads right back to where the girth is and comes all the way back to the hip uh, on the on the back side. So it's like if you had a long rope and folded it in half and then folded it in half again so you have both ends sitting right next to each other and the whole rope just looped around. It's kind of cool. I also want to talk about threshold of pain and signs of colic so we're going to get to all these right now. Alright I talked about the GI tract. It's basically a tube that runs through the horse and that's there's various sites where trouble can occur and we call these sites uh, particular names such as the pelvic flexure or the ilio, um, ileocecal junction or the nephrosplenic ligament and we'll get into those in a second. Now the way the gut works is there's a constant and progressive movement in one direction. So the food comes in one end and it goes all the way through and comes out the other. It's not supposed to go the other way. And the pace that it goes at is rated by content and disease. Now here's a website that you might want to write down. It's a YouTube web website. So it's utu.be and then forward slash 8NP. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of letters here. Well, anyway, grab a piece of paper and write it down. You can always look at the replay of this. But it's Lucy Ricardo and everybody, um, and I love Lucy, old, old show from the 50s, where Lucy is sitting at the chocolate factory and she's supposed to be wrapping the chocolates as they come out of the factory. Well, sometimes the, the conveyor belt would speed up and there would be too much for her to work with and she would get bug-eyed and, and try to wrap all the candies but not all of them would get wrapped and they would fall out on the floor and pass on through unwrapped to the other end. Well that's a great example of how diarrhea works and the opposite would be constipation where something doesn't move where the conveyor belt doesn't work then of course you have the blockage where you have the candies coming out but you have a block in the in the path of the on the candies on the conveyor belt or in this case the ingesta and then things just tend to back up and that's never a good uh, thing and this altered movement can cause pain and that's where the pain comes from it can either be gas distension or hypermotility or, or what have you and each horse responds to that completely differently and that's why I have written in here in red something very very important the degree of pain does not equal the severity of the colic. That's something you should write down and engrave someplace because every horse experiences pain differently. And just because it doesn't look painful doesn't mean it's a serious colic. And conversely, if the horse is down thrashing, it may be just a simple uh, spasmodic colic. Here are some signs of colic. It can vary from just not right to uncontrollable rolling and profuse sweating. Most owners know when the horse has colic before a casual observer can see it. It could be caused by, uh, or they can just leave grain. The, you know, you walk by and look in the stall, and, mm, my horse hasn't eaten its grain uh, or hay, doesn't want to eat the hay, or it's laying down when it normally doesn't, or the horse is sitting there pawing. These are all typical signs. Now I want to tell you a quick story in here. So we're going to take a pause, and I'm going to tell you about a cold January night in New York when I got called out to a horse farm for a colic and this trainer was a very experienced guy. He knows when a horse is colicking and he says, Doc, you not need to get out here right away. So I flew out to his barn. It's about 8 o'clock at night. It's cold and there's just a few incandescent light bulbs hanging in the tall ceiling. And I go down to the far end of the barn and there's a horse laying down, moaning and groaning. And this horse is checking out. I mean, he's all but dead. 
and I'm just absolutely sure that's what the problem is. And I decide to just go out to the truck, get my euthanasia solution because I knew he didn't want to go to surgery, and put an end to it. But all the training I had at Cornell told me to go in and do a thorough exam. So I did. So I'm trying to get the horse up, and I can't get him up off the ground. And the trainer says, Doc, I've been trying for a half hour, 45 minutes. It, you know, I've been done everything to get this horse up, and I can't make it move. It's just laying there. And the horse continued to lay there for me, moaning and groaning. So I started listening to his guts while I laid down there, take his heart rate. I found that his heart rate was almost normal, which surprised me because I thought this horse was dying, and I expected a higher heart rate, which I'll talk about a little bit later in this program. Finally, <clears throat> I try to get the horse up, but I can't hear everything, so I need to take the blanket off. It's winter, and, and he's cold. So I start undoing the straps, and there's one strap that went under its hind leg, what I call a groin strap, and it's really tight. So I just really worked hard and finally got it loose and undid it, and then I tapped the horse with my toe. The horse sprung to his feet, gave a whole body shake, and walked over and started eating hay. Now there's a horse that had an absolutely low threshold of pain, and the groin strap of the blanket was pain, too painful for him, and he showed all the signs of a classic colic, a very painful colic, a colic that make most people think the horse is dying. The trainer was so embarrassed, he actually hunched down and, and walked out of the barn, and, and he and I knew each other really well, so I just started laughing really loud because... I was ready to put this horse to sleep other than just doing a good physical exam. That's what I mean by it's not how pain here. The degree of pain does not equal the severity of the colic. That's what you have to learn from that lesson. Okay, here's a couple other things that horses will do. They can start rolling either gentle or very aggressively. The abdomen can be tucked up. The males can have their penis drop down a few inches. They can be agitated, circle the stall tail can be propped up, they can act depressed, basically anything different from a normal horse. That's what a colicking horse is. And colic doesn't tell you exactly what it is, it just tells you that there's some abdominal pain and you need to get a good diagnosis done. The problem is there's so many confusion, confusing signs. He could be uh, affected by something else. For example, pain from an injury, a foreign object in the mouth, fever, infection of the intestines, ulcers, bad feet, rabies, yes, rabies, foaling, in other words, uh, a difficult birth, etc. If you didn't know your mare was in foal and she's trying to give birth and it's stuck, that's going to act like colic. I've had a horse that had a broken tooth uh, that acted like colic. I've had a horse with a piece of wood stuck across the hard palate, the roof of the mouth between two teeth, and it wasn't until I removed the foreign object from the mouth that the horse finally stopped colicking. And I had another horse that got scared by some pigs, and he slipped on the pavement and fell down on his nose and busted his two front teeth out. And that horse, before I could do anything with his mouth, was colicking from the pain and the stress. So we have to figure out what's causing it, and sometimes it can be outside the body. So here's the next important thing. There are two types of colics, medical and surgical. Now, there's all sorts of names for all these different things. I mentioned some of them, impactions, uh, uh, spasmodic colics, intussusceptions, you know, blah, 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 tons of words. All you have to know as a horse owner is that there are two types of colics, medical and surgical. And knowing the difference is important in, important in determining a course of action. So let's get into that. Here's the types of medical colics. Something called spasmodic colics, impactions of the pelvic flexure, cecum, functional injury, emotional, drug-induced, and they, they usually respond to antispasmodic medications uh, such as banamine and the pain relievers such as uh, rompum or xylazine and rehydration. Spasmodic colic is the most common and its causes include changes in atmospheric pressure, abrupt changes in feed, but not the removal of grain. That's interesting. I'll go over that in a second. And parasite migration. That's probably the number one reason, parasite migration. But the hallmark sign of a spas spasmodic colic is lots of gurgling, audible to the ear while standing next to the horse. I mean, it sounds like 
drums beating in there. It just is gurgling and bubbling like a tar pit. That's what a spasmodic colic is. Impactions, on the other hand, you have decreased motility and it creates an accumulation of feed that with continued absorption of the fluid creating a dry, non-movable mass. It's common in the pelvic flexor, which is a large bowel right there in the pelvis, and also in the cecum. The problem with the cecum is that's the thing that feel, looks like the toe, pardon me, of a sock, and the, and the impactions usually start down at the toe and work their way up. So by the time you can feel it with a rectal exam, we've got the whole cecum filled. <coughs> Overhydration can help in early, son early ones. By superhydrating the horse by IV fluids, you can actually get the fluids to go into these dry masses and help them start moving. But if it's too late, surgery with poor results can occur. Prevention is the most effective cost approach. And the functional, again, is injury with associated spasmodic colic. The horse had busted his two teeth out. Environmental stress like overheating, that's a real good cause for colic in some horses. You bring the horse into a new barn. There are new horses that you bring into your barn. You upset the social structure. Any of these can upset some horses. I will tell you that most of these horses that get upset and are stressed over things like a new barn, heat, and a new horse are usually on grain. And if you want to stop having colics due to horses that are, are seems just stressed and get these occasional spasmodic colics, the best thing you can do is get them off grain because grain can uh, cause ulcers of the colon, not of the stomach, but of the colon. And that is probably a leading cause of colic in most horses. Some horses can have a reaction to drugs where the drugs can uh, slow the gut down and over medication where they're really heavily sedated for a while can slow the gut down to stop. Uh, loss of a friend, I've seen that where um, a horse loses its buddy, whether it's another horse or a goat or any, a mini, anything, that can cause it. And we have to identify what the cause is and resolve that if we want to treat the colic correctly. Now here are some surgical colics. Something more than an injection is needed to resolve the colic. This is often, but not always, preceded by an unnoticed spasmodic colic. And only surgery or removing the obstruction will relieve the colic. The gut usually does not gurgle. They call that ileus. It's a very quiet gut, hypomodal, decreased gut sounds, and sometimes absolutely quiet. And if you know how to ping a gut by flicking your finger on the side, and you use the stethoscope, you can actually hear the sound go all the way across the gas-filled bowel, bounce off the side and come back, just like you hear in those submarine um, movies where they're pinging uh, another sub. The impaction can be of the small bowel or the large bowel, the cecum, and occasionally the stomach or rectum, um, and it usually does not, does not respond to overhydration. The small bowel obstruction can be twists, Large bowels can be twists and some others. Let me go into those right now. The most common in the small is, the, is the obstruction of the, in the small diameter of the pelvic flexure of the colon. The colon is very large. It can be up to a foot wide, but when it gets to the pelvic flexure, it can narrow down to four inches wide, and a lot of manure just gets backed up there if the motility is effective for any reason, which includes colonic ulcers and parasite migrations. These are often palpated with a rectal exam, and I'm not saying that you as a horse owner should, should um, do a rectal exam. In fact, I strongly recommend that you never do a rectal exam unless you've been properly trained. So a veterinarian should be doing this. Uh, dried feed is the most common. Other causes include sand, tumor, a fecalith, which is just a foreign object that's gotten into your horse's stomach, such as the nylon webbing of rubber fencing. And feces just creates this lith. Lith is a Latin name for stone. So you get a fecal stone in there, and they just create blockages. They can get as large as a basketball. Parasites can alter the migration, or pardon me, the movement of the bowel, and of course a foreign object, which goes back to the fecal lith. And in foals, it's really common to have an obstruction called a meconium obstruction, and that's just the first feces of, of a foal. They're large, they're dry, and they don't move it out, and we often have to just extract these with our fingers. 
Small bowel obstruction would be something called a pedunculated lipoma. Just think of a ball of fat hanging in on a string. And that fat just swings back and forth and finally flips around the small bowel and strangulates it. A mesenteric rent is basically there's a lacy covering that covers the whole bowel and on occasion it can get a little tear in there and a loop of small bowel can slip through it through the hole and it becomes trapped. You can also get this through the diaphragm into the lungs. It's pretty rare but it can happen and the small bowel can actually rotate on itself. But the large bowel is where a lot of things occur that are major. The ileocecal intussusception just think of a pirate's telescope and how you have a telescope that's elongated and you collapse it in on itself. Well, on occasion, the, the small intestine can collapse into the cecum and that creates a blockage because there's no blood flow. It becomes edematous and things just won't move, move through it. Um, the volvulus is when the, the large bowel rotates on itself. So pretend you've got that rope that's folded once and then folded twice. Now just rotate that 180 degrees and you can see that everything's blocked. I had a horse, a colic. Here's another story. I've got two stories here because they're just so good to, to relate. This horse, um, the, they called me. They were 45 minutes away and they said, Doc, I just want to know you're in town uh, and that you're available because we've got a horse that's just a little off. I said, all right, you know, I'm around. If you want me, just call me. Otherwise, you know, you want me to come down, I will. They said, no, no, we just want to make sure you were there. Um, and he was just about to say goodbye when we both heard in the background somebody say, she's going down. And I wrote a whole blog called She's Going Down. You can read it. Anyway, this horse went down, she says, and the, and the manager says, yeah, come on down. So I fly down there 45 minutes later. I get there. They're walking the horse in the... Uh, indoor arena and they tell me doc I cannot uh, stop this horse because as soon as I do it rolls down in agony so I get my stuff out and I get ready and I said okay just stop her I want to do a quick rectal I couldn't get the rectal down because the horse was so painful it just fell down so we got it moving and as the horse is walking I'm doing a rectal exam walking behind the mare in the indoor arena as I get in there, I can easily feel distended loops of large bowel. That tells me that we've got a volvulus. That couple with the pain, I medicate the horse. I put an IV catheter in. I tell them to get their horse trailer over, and I tell um, and I get on my phone and I call um, my answering service. And I said to my answering service, that's what we used to have back then for Cornell. I said, uh, Sue, this is Dr. Tucker. Uh, I've got a colic. You need to let Cornell know that I'll be up there in about 45 minutes to an hour. Have them ready for surgery, and I don't have time for a callback. And Sue said, gotcha, and she did. And um, I brought that horse into the trailer, and I anesthetized it, which means it was knocked out on the ground, out cold. And we trailed that horse all the way up to Cornell. About 20 minutes out, I had to give another dose. That's what the catheter was for. So the horse could um, continue to remain painless. As soon as we got it, the horse there, we dragged the horse out onto um, the surgery, into the surgery suite and did the surgery. And this horse didn't have a 180 degree twist, didn't have a 360 degree twist, but it had a 540, that's one and a half times complete looped around large bowel. And we did surgery right then and there within minutes. I'd say within three hours of that phone call, that horse was in with its belly open and its gut replaced. And, and that was fast. Now you're going to see later on in this another big red note for you to write down. And it talks about how fast it takes for you to get this horse to colic. That will determine how often these horses will survive. In this case, the horse came through surgery just fine, but 24 hours died of, of septic shock. And we did everything we could for that horse, but it just wasn't fast enough. So they can happen that quick. The horse is being ridden. They got off. The horse wasn't looking right suddenly went down and three hours later we had it with its bowel completely outside of him untwisting it and that was a pretty uh, strenuous volvulus. On the other hand we have something called the nephrosplenic ligament entrapment and that's where part of the pelvic flexure just starts to rise up out of position and gets hooked on the kidney, a, a ligament that holds the kidney and the spleen together and it can just get 
hooked on there. And when they first started doing these, we didn't know what to do, but we anesthetized the horses and actually physically rolled them on the ground to unhook this from, from occurring. And that's what a lot of people still do. Some other people give a drug that causes the spleen to shrink and contract to make it easier. And some other people actually go in there and tack the uh, bowel down so it won't rise up and do that ever again. But an effersplenic ligament is another type of large bowel instruction where the bowel folds on itself and manure can't get through. Here are some of the other things that can cause some obstructions. A rectal tear from somebody doing a rectal exam. Uh, melanoma of the anus. I know, I'm sure you've seen this in gray horses where the, bowel, uh, the anus has those large black lumps. And sometimes they can get so severe that it's almost impossible for a horse to defecate, although that's very rare. Then you have a fancy word called atresia, which just means that the foal is born without a hole in its anus, and there's nothing coming through there. Uh, that's called a, uh, uh, gosh, I just can't remember. I want to call it white foal syndrome, but that's not it. But it's only in certain breeds, western breeds, where they just don't have the anus formed. And then anything that can block the normal flow of a gesta, that's basically what we're talking about. All right. This, this one here, medical versus surgical, this is what you have to re really listen to. I put in red, a heart rate above 60. That is so critical. That's your cutoff point. I'll talk about that in a second. Another sign for surgical colic is pain, unresponsive medication. And a third is an abnormal rectal. Any one of these three are unusual or wrong, it's a surgical. And that's just the way it is. All right, let's talk about the heart rate. Everybody should know how to take the heart rate of the horse. Uh, most medical colleagues have a rate between 40 and 50. Now, 40 is a resting heart rate, even less than that. Um, but if you listen to the heart and you take a pulse or you've got a stethoscope or you just put your ear down behind their left shoulder and listen to the chest, a rate of 60 is one beat per sec second. That's 60 beats per minute. That's one per second. And if you've got something that's going one beat per second or faster, is probably surgical. Many surgical colics are closer to 70. Where it gets to be tough is those rates between 58 and 62. That requires some experience to determine whether they're surgical or medical. But I've always said a heart rate above 60 is surgical until proven otherwise. Response to medication, this is really important. If you've got something such as banamine and you give this to the horse and the horse remains painful, after normal dose of pain medication, it's probably surgical. On a rare occasion, it's not, but probably surgical. If you give uh, banamine and uh, it lasts four hours, but then the pain comes back, that's surgical. And if you if you give uh, the sorry, I've got these two backwards. There, if if um, any time before four hours, you give the dose and it seems to do well, but in one to two hours, the horse gets painful again. That's probably surgical. And then down here, if you give it and it goes four hours, but you have to repeat it and it later it's painful again. So you give two doses and it's, it then becomes painful. All you're doing is masking the pain. So these three types of unresponsive medications are surgical. In the rectal exam, again, only a vet should perform it. But if th we can feel palpation of gas in the bowel, that's abnormal. We can find out if something's missing, like the pelvic flexure, if it's not there. It's probably hooked on the nephrosplenic ligament. Or if it's an obstruction, we can actually feel the, the impaction. So some of the medical treatments. Take the temperature and the heart rate of your horse and note thoroughly what your horse is doing before calling your vet. So just don't call up your vet and say, I think my horse is colicking. If you call them up and say, I think my horse is colicking, the heart rate is 42, um, and he's basically just laying there comfortably, but he just he keeps looking at his side, the vet wants to know that. And depending on your vet, depending on your relationship with that vet and his policies and his practice, he may say, go ahead and give some medication and give me a call back, or he may say, I'll be on my way. That sounds really reasonable. I want to know what's going on. But the bottom line is you should call your vet first with, these informa with this information. All right, if you can't reach a vet, then follow the guidelines determining the type of colic your horse has and ship it to a hospital if necessary. What that means is if the heart rate's about 42, 45, something like that, maybe 50, and you hear a lot of gut sounds, it's probably a spasmodic colic, 
And if all you've got is some painkillers like banamine, that might help you. Again, this is if you cannot reach your vet. Because the vet knows more. It's not that just that your vet went to school to learn this. They've also seen dozens and dozens, hundreds of colic cases. And they've got experience. And you probably don't. You just want to know how to talk to your veterinarian a little bit better. And that's what this information is all about. It's about you learning what the difference is between a surgical and medical. So when your vet says to you, well, it's got a heart rate of 65, you already know you're going on the trailer to, for the, uh, the, to the surgery. All right. Now, what happens if you don't have uh, a veterinarian or for whatever reason you can't see a vet, the horse can't see it, and you don't have any medicines? These are some of the things that I'd recommend. I love Pepto-Bismol. Any brand of uh, bismuth subsalicylate can be used, but Pepto-Bismol is, is really good. I give eight ounces of that to a normal size horse. Obviously, if you got a pony or mini, you give less. If you have a draft horse, more. But thoroughbreds to warm bloods, eight ounces is fine. And you just use a two ounce, which is a 60 ml dose syringe. So you should have that on hand. If you don't have it, you can use a turkey baster or do something to get it in there. The funny thing is, I always know when my clients have given Pepto Bismol because there's usually pink all over the stall walls. But most horses will take it, and, mo and this will help a lot of spasmodic colics. That's because it has subsalicylate in it, which is basically aspirin, which is a, basically what banamine is. So that can help a lot. And you can repeat it in two hours if necessary. And there is a warning. The horse's manure will turn black, so don't be surprised if a day or two later you see black manure coming out. That's Pepto-Bismol. If it's freezing cold outside, offer warm wa water and get a blanket on and get the horse out of the wind. I'll never forget a horse I went to see that was just shivering cold. It was about 32 and a half degrees out, miserable rain, uh, just a horrible, horrible uh, November night. And she calls me out there to take a look. She says, I think my horse has colic. And sure enough, he, he was colicking. But it doesn't matter what injections you give or rectal exams you give. If you don't take care of what's causing it, the horse isn't being helped. So I got warm water, we got a blanket on the horse, and we got it inside out of the wind. We did those three things. You could just see the horse start to relax and melt. We also added clean, dry bedding because, remember, wet bedding draws away body heat. Wet bedding draws away body heat. If you do not believe me, I will give you an example, but I must warn you. from the stove with a hot handle and you take a potholder and lift it up you don't feel the heat that's because the potholder is dry but if your potholder gets wet if you soak in water and then grab that you'll instantly be burned that's what I mean by wet bedding draws away body heat so people who say they have a, a manure pack for a horse to lay on when it's cold out there it's wet and that wet is just going to chill that horse down into nothing be sure your blankets are adjusted correctly. Remember what I said about that tight groin strap on that blanket. And do whatever other nursing care you can possibly do. A lot of these horses are just a little upset. And also, take the grain away. Grain, I believe, is the number one cause of, of colic in horses, secondary to parasites. We'll get into that in prevention in a second. The temperature should be 101 or less. That's normal. On a hot day, if it's a cold winter's day, maybe 98, 99, but somewhere 101 or below is normal, especially if you're in the afternoons, 3 in the afternoon, it's a hot day out, 101. If it's 102 or 103, there's a good chance that the colic is secondary to something else, and you definitely need a veterinarian out there to figure out what it is. And remember, a pulse greater than 60 means you need to transport your horse to veterinary clinic for examination, continuous observation, nursing, and possibly surgery. And I want to go back to this just for a second. A pulse greater than 60 means you need to transport your horse. I'm going to really stress that in about four or five more slides, why that's important. With a medical um, colic, you should discuss with your veterinarian um, be, how, how they handle it, because every vet in every region has different medications and different protocols. I use a combination of painkiller plus an antispasmodic. I give it IV and the results occur within minutes. You can see these horses relax. 
If you give anything intramuscularly or orally, the results may take up to 30 minutes, so be aware of that. And some vets will tell you to give drugs before they commit to coming out to your farm, and some vets will forbid it. So ask today before you have a problem and find out what your vet says so you're on board and on the same page. And again, the rectal exam should only be performed by a veterinarian. There is a risk of perforating the rectum, which is life-threatening to the horse. If you do not know what you're doing and you cause a tear in the rectum and you pull your hand out and there's blood on the sleeve, you've complicated things. So really, don't do rectals on your own. You can perforate them. And besides, if you've never done a rectal exam before, you're just going to be groping around in the dark. You won't know what's normal and what's abnormal. So please, don't do a rectal exam. It's not in your horse's best interest. Some people like to stomach tube their horse. Most vets today are instructed to do this. The purpose is to find evidence of reflux, which is basically throw up, if you will, that's in the stomach. A horse can't throw up. He can't take and ingest a something sour in the stomach and get it out of there. But you can pass a stomach tube and that can get it out, which is really good. Um, and also, you can administer water and mineral oil to hydrate impactions. Not all vets will do this. I just didn't think that tubing was very good, um, but I would do it just to make sure there wasn't any gas in there. And some people do something called a peritoneal tap, where they stick a needle and they and they place the needle deep into the um, into the abdomen, right in the ventral midline, right on the belly of the horse, and they're looking for any fluid because. The fluid, there should be no fluid coming out, but sometimes with inflamed bowel, they'll stick a needle in and the fluid just comes pouring out. That's not a good sign. That definitely is a surgical colic. Okay, here comes another important point. The time it takes to get a horse to surgery is directly proportional to the success of the outcome. Now, I had that horse in to the surgery within three hours, and I thought we were doing really well. And they do have better ways of taking care of horses, and that horse may have survived now. But back then, we didn't know about uh, post-operative uh, uh, inflammation of the, of the bowel but um, and, and systemic shock. But that's what happened to this one. But people who take their time and wait to see often have poor outcomes as they go to, to the university or to the surgery suite. At that point, it's too late, and you've missed it. It is much better to take a surgical horse, a high heart rate, pain unresponsive medication, to surgery than it is to wait for the signs uh, to progress. I really can't uh, uh, overstate that. So many people, so many horror stories of people who said, I just waited, I thought it'd get better. No, spend your money, go to the hospital, let them observe the horse. They don't always go to colic. And in addition, occasionally, a bumper trailer ride a bumpy trailer ride will help to untwist a twisted gut and end the colic. And I've seen this happen more and more times where the horse is surgical, high heart rate, abnormal bowel, everything. And they've called me, it's within 30 to 60 minutes. We get on a trailer and they hit all the bumpy roads. And by the time they get to the university or to the surgery suite, the horse is eating hay and says, What's up? Uh, completely resolved. So this can happen, it's happened many times. Don't go crazy. I mean, don't go swerving around and, you know, hit the curbs, but try and find a nice bumpy road to go up and down. Plenty of horse farms are on bumpy roads. You need to determine today whether you're willing to spend the money on surgery. And if you are, create a fund because it's going to cost some money. Almost every clinic now demands that you have a deposit of $5,000 on a credit card that you put on file because they say it's going to cost that much. And they may be able to um, finance the rest of it, but they want their money up front. Also, love your horse daily. Colics are sudden and can be fatal overnight. And don't let them suffer while you make a decision. Time is critical to the surgery success. So make your decisions now on how you want to proceed. For instance, if you have a geriatric horse, it's 30, 35 years old, and you say, nope, this one's not going to go to, to surgery, fine. You've made a decision. Now you don't have to worry. Okay, prevention. We only have a few more slides here, and we're going to get to some questions. The prevention is really good. Uh, create a good, healthy environment. Treat the horse like a living being, not an inanimate object stuck in a stall like an RV waiting to be pulled out and used on a weekend. These guys are living, breathing beings, and they need to know that they're safe, that they're comfortable, that they're free from um, stress. That's so important. 
Make sure they have plenty of fresh water and at freezing temperatures consider warming that water with some sort of heating element. Have plenty of hay at all times. It is a natural laxative for sand. Sand colic is just the accumulation of sand in the intestines. It sinks out into a low spot in the bowel and will not come out once it's in there. My friend is a, uh, was a uh, vet for the Miami Zoo and she um, had to euthanize an elephant and she took out over 200 pounds of sand in this poor elephant's uh, bowel that it just consumed over time. I want you to consider removing grain from the diet. Grain has been proven to cause ulcers of the colon or the large bowel. I've seen so many beha behavioral issues resolve within two to three days of removing a horse from grain that it's now my mission in life to let everybody know about removing grain from the diet. You can do this overnight and I can talk about that a little bit if you got a question to answer on this or I might even have a whole webinar on that coming up. Parasite prevention is so paramount. I've got another uh, webinar on that scheduled. Uh, parasites are, are, are such a, um, a problem in horses and um, basically deworm, deworm, deworm. Um, Make sure that your horse is clean, but the best way to prevent parasites in your horse is to clean up the environment it lives in. Make sure it never eats anywhere it defecates, both in the stall and in the paddock. Clean up the manure and you're going to clean up parasites. That's the, that's the sum total of parasite prevention in a horse. Know your horse. Know the ins and outs. Know when it's uh, not feeling good. Take um, Practice taking the vital signs, the heart rate, respiratory rate. Listen to the gut sounds. Know what normal is. And there's no supplement or special routine that prevents colic. Just good horsemanship and horse husbandry. And here are the take-home points. The degree of pain does not equal the severity of the colic. And the least amount of time between onset and surgery increases the success of the surgery. And prevention is cheap. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And in the meantime, while you get some of those questions to me, I want you to know that I've put together a whole thing on this, and this will be part of the colic page in the horsesadvocate.com. And when you click on memberships at the top of the page, uh, you'll be taken to the comparative um, uh, programs. So we have the red, yellow, and uh, the yellow, red, and blue ribbon packages, and we have a special program for. Um, that's down there. Uh, we have some special pricing uh, for this seminar, for this webinar of $9.99 a month uh, that is going to be there for a limited time. So I want you to take advantage of this. At least do it for a month. Go in there and look at it. I will give you a little caveat. This is September of 2015. Uh, this website was hacked, uh, attacked, and shut down, and I've been rebuilding it over the summer. And there's still some pages in there that I'm working on almost every day to bring back to this original glory uh, with fresh uh, um, photographs. There's thousands of photographs in there, uh, dozens of videos, uh, some, some really innovative thinking uh, ideas of how to express um, things like colons, you know, how they're put together, uh, long toe, low heel in horses, um, just how to tie up a horse to the stall, how to lead to a horse at the same time, tons of husbandry. Uh, just It's just such a loaded uh, resource that it's crazy not for you to at least try to take a look at it. We have a free site on there. You see 10 of the topics uh, for free. So go to thehorsesadvocate.com and check it out. All right, some of the questions. Um, the biggest question I'm getting is this no grain theory. And no grain is just so important. Every time you put something in the horse's uh, mouth, just like when you eat it and swallow it, you've only placed it in a tube that runs through your body. And that solid food has to be broken down into what I call uh, molecules, basically, that those molecules get transported across the solid wall. Now, there's not a person who's listening to this that doesn't realize that when there's stuff inside the stomach, or inside the intestines, you never want that to just come across and leak through and get into your body. It'll kill you. It's called peritonitis, and it'll kill you it's so rapidly and it's painful, it's horrible. So what's inside the gut has to stay inside the gut, inside the intestines, and the only thing it's allowed to cross are the molecules of food, and that's the important thing. The problem is not all molecules are treated the same. So some horses 
and some people too have some things that come across no problems such as water and for us good green vegetables for a horse would be hay and, and grass these are the natural things that horse is born and, and, and developed to, to eat there's billions of bacteria in the hindgut that take that grass and break it down into essential components and those are transported across the gut membrane the problem is every time you give grain grain is like lighter fluid on burning embers it causes inflammation it actually causes pus to come down there white blood cells it causes fissures and causes them to um, um, oh, we just got another question here and it causes the fissures which causes the gut to actually leak uh, those that leakage can cause inflammation that inflammation is what can cause a lot of these colics it can cause horses to be hard keepers it can cause a horse to be uneasy not happy uh, uh, not willing to load doesn't want to be brushed doesn't want to be groomed doesn't like its girth tightened uh, and has a little bit of water around the, the manure when they, they, they form solid balls and they drop on the ground at the last point they actually um, what do they call it they actually um, uh, have a little squirts and that's all signs of um, uh, inflammation in large bowel and the number one cause of that is grain think of all that I love Lucy um, thing that I told you in the very beginning where um, the conveyor belt starts to go through too fast and these the, the manure comes out with too much water it's not being absorbed and that's what's happening if you cut the grain nine times out of ten that will um, that'll just stop all right. Um, what if they're not on a hay diet? Uh, I'm not too sure what that means. Not on a hay diet. Um, most horses have grass. That's the best thing. Um, let me just uh, let me just write something here. I'm typing and writing this and talking at the same time, and I'm a man and I can't do two things at once. So pardon me for that pause. But a lot of the um, uh, diets have to have roughage if you're on an all-grain diet that's probably the worst thing you can do for a horse if they're on grass that's great uh, down in South Florida we don't have much grass uh, certainly in the winter time in the Northeast you have to supplement that grass with hay um, and that hay is basically dried grass and usually does well so um, Nancy you're asking what if they're not on a hay diet um, maybe you could just let us know what kind of diet they are on because I find that some horses are very sensitive I'll give you an example uh, Melissa's horses were on grain when I first met her uh, she's taken them all off grain and all the manure became dry and normal the behavioral problems such as being antsy in a stall all went away um, then she discovered that on the three-day eventing uh, on the um, cross-country course her horse would actually recover so much faster was not winded was not panting um, and she thought everything was fine but she decided to put the horses back on one cup of oats twice a day and just one cup of oats twice a day brought back all the signs it's not the quantity of food it's it's just the reaction to that food just like a, a person who has some uh, uh, inflammation to gluten their celiac um, it doesn't take a lot of gluten to get a response in these people so same thing with a horse it didn't take much grain to get the horses back to the problems that she was having so she took everyone off grain again unfortunately there's this one horse is very sensitive and this horse still had a little bit of squirts so she looked everywhere and she's feeding the daily dewormer called Strongid C which I think is a phenomenal product for people who have horses in infested areas but the problem is half of Strongid C is corn so she went to Strongid C2X and removed the corn and that really helped then a second one was um, then, then the horse the horse still was having a problem and uh, that um, and that and then we found that the red salt lick the trace mineral salt blocks had corn syrup in it and she finally took that away and finally the horse stopped having the squirts so that horse is extremely sensitive to any kind of sugar so make sure your horse doesn't have any supplements with corn 
or red salt, like let's go to the Himalayan salt, uh, give them that, and water and hay and, and, and uh, grass. Now, if you don't have hay, I'm getting an update here. Um, what supplement a horse that is not able to get good grass diet? Um, there is a product out there that I tend to like. It's a high fat diet. It's made out of coconut flakes called Cool Stance. And Cool Stance by itself is a really great product, but there's some horses that don't like it. So Manapro has put together something called Renew Gold, which uses Cool Stance in it, and plus some rice bran. And I find that horses that are very old that aren't keeping their weight on can do well on Renew Gold. It comes in a 30 pound uh, bag. Um, I think it costs 35 bucks, maybe 40 bucks, and you only feed a pound of it a day. And that pound of uh, Renew Gold can provide most of the calories a horse needs to maintain their weight, especially if they're on a poor grass diet or a minimum grass diet. But a horse that doesn't have access to grass and hay is now um, not being treated like a horse should. Um, and you can't give a lot of grain. I don't believe in a sugar beet pulp. And by the way, I always called it sugar beet because that's its true name. I, I keep the word sugar in front of it. It has a higher glycemic index, according to a veterinarian friend of mine, and says it doesn't have as much of the reactions as the other sugars that are out there. But it still is a sugar. And if you're trying to avoid sugar in your horse's diet, I would try to find the best quality hay and as much grass as you can. And if you can't find grass, give more hay. And, and then in addition, if they need some more energy, try the Renew Gold at one pound um, per, uh, per horse per day. All right, I think I'm just about done here. Um, let's see if there are any other questions. I'd just like to uh, talk about uh, parasites just one more time. Um, a lot of people think that deworming is the best way that you can um, – um, the best way that you can uh, prevent parasites, but it's not. It's it's closing the barn doors, you know, after the horse is gone, basically. And now everyone's talking about parasite resistance, um, uh, the resistance to the drugs, but um, it's it's not that. It's cleanliness. Um, the drugs that we use in horses, ivermectin, strontia, and others, are approved for use in humans. Yet we as humans don't realize that we can get parasites too. But it is a worldwide problem, and ivermectin has been used to help uh, humans that are infected with parasites in other countries. And I went to my local uh, drugstore, Walgreens, and on their shelf they had Strongid for sale. And I took a picture of it. It's on my website. To see Strongid, the same stuff I'm giving my uh, cat, dog, and horse, is for sale for me to take over the counter. And the reason you and I don't have parasites is because we don't eat where we defecate. We use knives and forks. That's parasite control. It's not mismanners. It takes our dirty, manure-stained fingers away from my mouth and away from the food and allows us to eat cleanly. That's what it's all. They, they were made before soap and water. We only recently got running water inside our homes and soap uh, dispensers. So we're now very uh, aware of cleanliness, and we don't have a parasite problem. But if your horse is eating where it defecates, that's where... Um, you're going to have a problem with parasites. So get rid of the parasites by deworming once a week for three weeks with ivermectin. That's ivermectin today and then next Sunday and then next Sunday. And that will clean up. Uh, it's the frequency of deworming that's the most important. And that will help clean up the parasites that may be a problem. And quit feeding grain to those horses that are susceptible to colic. They have low-grade colics. Um, and that's probably going to remove um, a lot of the issues. Let me just uh, text Matt. Um, <laughs> I, I'm trying to do this and, and talk, and of course that never works. Uh, I think he said there's one more question. Um, but I think otherwise I've covered everything. Um, you guys can always um, email me, especially if you're in the Horses Advocate, and uh, get some of your questions answered. And I really recommend that you try out the Horse Advocate. Um, Oh, whole, uh, whole oats before performing. Uh, oats is a grain, period. And uh, we've all been told about doing a carb load before exercise. Athletes do this all the time. But what I'm suggesting is that horses actually can um, perform just as well 
uh, without having uh, some sort of grain in there as an energy source. Because again, grain wasn't produced for horses. It's actually a, um, an over uh, supplied uh, product of the agricultural industry that they've created a new market for. And that's the new market is horses. But 50 or more years ago, we didn't have grain that you could just pick up the phone, call, and have it delivered. Grain is basically a new uh, concept. It's certainly a man made idea, and we thought that we could get more energy. But from my experience of seeing tens of thousands of horses, we see this almost daily. And the people that we convince to get off grain, we see a tremendous improvement in the behavior of their horses, and colic instances go down to zero. So we really believe that no grain makes a big difference. If you're worried about your horse competing, listen to my thoughts about what Melissa found with her um, endurance horse, pardon me, her three-day eventing horse. At the cross country, the horse barely came in huffing and puffing and recovered so quickly while she's walking, all, watching all the other horses just huffing and puffing and having slow recovery times. I also had another horse that... Um, I told all about this, the um, grain sensitivity, and she started to listen to me. She was pretty well convinced, but uh, three or four days later, that horse ended up in the hospital for five days, intensive care for colic, and they diagnosed colonic ulcers, and they recommended that this horse goes off grain. So that just emphasized and, and enforced what I just spent an hour telling her at her farm while I was floating horse's teeth. So now she was convinced. And six months later, I saw the horse, and she said one of the interesting findings was when the massage therapist came out several months after she went off grain, the massage therapist couldn't find any more knots in the horse's muscle bellies. They had just virtually gone away because the horse was no longer contracting uh, spontaneously or sporadically or spasmodically uh, from the sugar load that it was having. Um, there's a product called Succeed, uh, which you may have seen S-U-C-C-E-E-D. Uh, it's made by a fellow named John Hall out of Ohio, who's a horseman who's sick and tired of horses having colics. And he did research and found that most of the horses in the post-mortem room had colonic ulcers to some degree. And he correlated that with grain. So he developed this product called Succeed. And his whole goal is to get everybody off grain and put himself out of business. And I joke with him every year at the AAP conference. So I say, I'm doing my best to put you out of business. And he puts a big smile on his face. Because he would rather have people off grain. But if you are going to be on grain, you can supplement with succeed. And that can help calm the gut down. All right. I think that's about it. I've been on here for an hour, just about an hour. I think uh, that's about all anybody can take on, on Labor Day weekend. Uh, I know you guys, most everyone has tomorrow off. I've got the whole day. <clears throat> Melissa and I are going to be working, floating some teeth. But... Um, we love what we do. We love the fact that you guys are here listening. And um, I'm going to just move to the last page and say thank you for your time becoming the Horses Advocate. And if you've got any questions, I'm just going to pause here for a couple more minutes and see if they can come in. And Matt's going to ask me about them. Otherwise, I'm going to wish you all good night.